Hi, my name is Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to my May wrap up. So, um, as of today, it is Saturday the 11th of May. I've read, picked up four books so far this month. I've read two of them and DNF'd two of them. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is the book that I read for my book club. We had, um, we met at the library this morning um, to talk about the bookseller of Kabul. Um, I'll put a picture up because I took the book back to the library this morning. Let me just check the author's name. Um, so it's written by Asna Sayerstad, um, and it is non-fiction translated from Norwegian by Ingrid Christofferson. So I DNF this book. There was only four of us at the book club today. Two people read it. Two people DNF'd it. Um, it was published about twenty years ago, and the author is a Norwegian like kind of war correspondent, and she spent around three months living with this family in Kabul. And she talks a bit about this in the introduction to the book. And then the book itself reads um, like a novelisation. So it's third person. You've got like an omniscient narrator. And it's about um, this family. So the Sultan who has like a couple of wives, loads of children, owns a bookshop. Um, and... Yeah, so it sort of reads as if it's a novel. I only got about 60 odd pages in. Um, partly because some of the content was just a bit too kind of disturbing and I wasn't really in the mood for that. But also because I must have looked it up online when I read the introduction and found out that the family, so the, the Sultan's second wife, um, took the author to court I think after the book was published to say that it was untrue there was stuff in, I don't know the details but there was stuff in there that wasn't true about the family um, and the wife won that case against the author but then on appeal the author won the appeal so it was found to be what was in the book was true so um what struck me as odd about the book was the choice to write it as if it were a novel because um, by the author removing herself from the story. So it wasn't about her time spent with the family and, you know, and she wasn't part of that story of what is happening in her interactions with the family. She's completely removed herself from the narrative. And to me, I felt like that does sort of skew it a bit because her being there is an important part of the picture that we're getting I think so it felt a little bit of a jolt to me um moving from the introduction to the book itself when that sort of total change happened um and well clearly from you know the court case we know certainly some of the family members weren't happy with the book um, and subsequently I believe that the bookseller went on to write his own book about, I think, his life and his family. Um, so I don't know. I felt like I, I just wasn't really invested in it to want to carry on um, for those reasons. Uh, we had a really interesting discussion, though, in the book club about the book itself, about um, that stuff that I've just mentioned, which the others weren't aware of. And then sort of, as always happens when we read, you know, interesting books, the, the conversation uh broadens out to talk about sort of other themes and topics so it was a really good meeting um next month for june we'll be reading the lamplighters by emma stonex which i have read before i read it a few years ago when it came out and really enjoyed it although i don't remember too much detail about it because i have a terrible memory but i am looking forward to rereading that one so that was my book club book um i've re i realized as well that three of the four books i've picked up so far this month are translated. Um, so the first book I finished was The Whole by Hiroko Oyamada, which is translated from Japanese by David Boyd. It's a very, very short book. It's less than 100 pages. And I wasn't keen on it. I didn't dislike it, but I felt kind of indifferent towards it. It didn't really evoke any emotion of any kind in me. Um, it's 
what I would call sort of a quietly surreal novel. It's about um, a woman whose husband gets a new job and they move next door to his parents. Um, it's set during a hot summer, so the book does have quite a sort of stifling feel to it. And it's really about this woman um, trying to like cope with living uh, in such close proximity to her in-laws. Um, the surrealness comes in because, well, there is a hole that the woman sort of falls down a hole at one point, but then like quickly gets out of it again. There is kind of a strange creature, but that doesn't really go anywhere. Like there's surreal, that's sort of like quietly surreal elements, but to me, It wasn't quite weird enough. I mean, it's not fair to say a book isn't something when a book is what it is, right? But it was just a bit like I didn't quite get the messaging. I wasn't quite sure how I was meant to feel on reading it. And I think I just didn't maybe get it. So I would not rush out to meet, read more by the author. If someone so tell, told me that one of their other books like was really good, was worth a read, I would pick it up if I could get it like from the library or something. But this was just like, yeah, like it was all right um i'll tell you about the other book i read before i tell you about my dnf um so the other one i finished was the gathering by cj tudor this is a book that i had been highly anticipating i have loved all of cj tudor's books she's had one two three so i think this is a six novel and she's had a short story collection as well and i've really really enjoyed all of them um and it says as well that all of her books probably not including this one because it's only just been published, but all of her books are in development or have been optioned for TV, which I feel like is quite impressive. Um, so this is sort of, I'd call this a thriller with horror elements. Um, there is a quote from Stephen King on the back, which is not particularly in relation to this book, but just in relation to CJ Tudor in general. And Stephen King says, if you like my stuff, you'll like this. And I'd agree with that. I think if you like Stephen King, you're likely to like CJ Tudor. I actually prefer CJ Tudor to Stephen King. So The Gathering um, is set in Alaska, um, in this like small town where a teenage boy has been killed. And a police officer called Barbara, I think, um, she's an out-of-state detective. She's brought in to help the sheriff to investigate this this murder. Um, the the town is called Dead Heart. Um, the inhabitants of the town believe that the murder is attributed to this vampire colony, which reside on sort of the outskirts of the town. So in the the world of this book, vampires are um, like a, just a, a thing that that exists that live on this uh, in this community they are very much outsiders um they and I, what i do think the book does really well is how it sort of uses the analogy of this vampire commune to shed a light on prejudices and in terms of how the people in the town um react to and think about the vampires because the vampires are i guess slightly different to how we uh, have seen vampires sort of generally in other sort of fiction and in, in film and they are sort of able to coexist to a certain point except for the you know bad relations between the sort of two groups of people if vampires are people you know what i mean anyway um so yeah so the detective barbara is under pressure to order a call of the vampire colony which she is i think allowed to do in certain certain circumstances and things are proven against these vampires um but she's not sure if it really is down to the vampires or not um i found this very very entertaining it uh, i sort of sped through it quite quickly really enjoyed cj tudor's writing and pacing um there are i think one or two aspects of this which veer into the being slightly more disturbing slightly more gruesome not like massively so and not continually throughout but you know in terms of the as, as a thriller it edges more towards having those 
slightly sort of darker elements in there um but i thoroughly enjoyed it i'd highly recommend it i'd recommend any of cj tudor's books like i think you could pick any of them up and you'd enjoy them they are all um standalone as far as i know there's no continuing characters in any of them that i'm aware of um but i always always look forward to cj tudor's new book so um yeah if you like your sort of thrillers with a side of horror head to this one and then let me tell you about the other book that i have dnf'd so far this month so you may have seen last month i did a big try a chapter video where i tried a chapter of like 60 odd books on my tbr shelves um and that was really successful so i managed to get rid of a fair amount of books i won't tell you exactly how many in case you haven't seen the video i'll try and remember to link it below um but what that's done is now when i look at my shelves i feel really like, excited for the books that are on there i feel like i've sort of cut away some of the other ones that have been on there for years which every time i've looked at them i've been like i don't know if i'm ever going to want to read you they're gone i say they're gone they're in piles on the floor over there but they will leave the house soon um so but yeah so when i look at my shelves i'm actually like really excited and the the books that i tried a chapter off and decided to keep um that has sort of reinvigorated my interest in picking them up so it's it's been a really really like positive thing so one of the books that i decided to keep even though i've dnf'd it now but that's okay um was the discomfort the discomfort of evening by marika lucas reinfeld which is translated from dutch by michelle hutchison so this won the International Booker Prize in 2020. Um, it is very much a Marmite book. Lots and lots of people passionately dislike this book and I do understand why. Um, when I've mentioned this book in the past, people have said to me, don't bother with it, get rid. Um, but on reading the first chapter, I was interested. I quite liked the first chapter, so I did want to give it a go. I made it to about three quarters of the way through, to be fair. So I, I gave it a good shot. What's it about? It's told from the point of view of a 10 year old girl who lives with her family on a farm. I think it's a dairy farm. And right towards the start of the book, something tragic happens um, for the family. And then we see the impact of that through the eyes of this child. Um, we see how different family members cope with or try to cope with what's happened in different ways we see the impact it has on a family as a whole and we see how it affects our narrator who is called jazz um she carries a certain amount of guilt for what's happened she religion plays a part in the book as well she keeps sort of like making these pacts with god like if you'll let this happen then i'll do this um the book, there is a lot of talk of bodily functions in the book, both from the people in the family, also from like the animals on the farm. Stuff is described in a very disgusting way. Um, this is not one to read while eating your dinner. Um, it's really gross in many parts. Um, and I can understand that putting off a lot of people. There are lots of things in this book that would put off people, understandably so. I feel like this is a very niche book. The audience of this book is not wide at all. Um, but I don't think it's a bad book. I think it's very effective in what it sets out to do. Even though I maybe don't totally get everything the author's intending. But I think it's very impactful. I do think the child narrator is very well done. I think there's a lot of nuance within that. This is the probably up there is one of the most uncomfortable books I've ever read. I mean, I didn't finish it, but you know what I mean. Um, I guess, hence the title, The Discomfort of Evening. It's uncomfortable in its descriptions. It's uncomfortable in the child narrator and how, and some of her behaviours and how she, see she, how she sees things. Um, there is animal cruelty in the book as well, understandably. A lot of people are not going to want to read that um it's a very difficult read it's a very challenging read um i do think it's well written because 
to have such a reaction to a book and to be made to feel so incredibly uncomfortable by a book I think is an achievement and I presume that's what the author kind of wanted um to a point but yeah it, I got to a point where it was too much there was too much disturbing stuff for me um and I couldn't carry on I feel like I need to take my brain out of my head and scrub it clean um to get some of this imagery out of my head and I am looking forward to getting this book out of the house because it's kind of disgusting and just disturbing yeah it's a lot this book is a lot one book it kind of put me in mind of and it's not wholly similar but it's the one book that did come to mind is the wasp factory by ian banks i think it's ian banks um because that's a book that also has a child narrator um and it is quite disturbing there is some gruesome imagery in that book there's animal cruelty in that book so there's a number of sort of areas where i thought there was some overlap so if you like the wasp factory i would recommend the discomfort of evening otherwise want to go into with a lot of caution um so i have started another book actually which i'll just mention now so again you know i was looking at my shelves i was like what do i want to read and i've picked up a book that's been on my shelves for several years now um, and i'm so happy that i'm finally reading it the mermaid and mrs hancock by imogen hermes gower and um, which is historical fiction i won't talk too much about it because you'll hear about it well in about probably like 30 seconds for you when i've finished it i'll tell you about it um but i'm 60 odd pages in really really enjoying it honestly this like try chapter on whole project thing was so good it's made such a difference like when i look at my tbr shelves now i sort of feel liberated um so i recommend you to do something similar if you like me feel weighed down by the weight of your physical tbr um but i will check in with you probably in like a week's time once i've read slash dnf some more stuff it's now saturday the 25th of may it's bank holiday weekend in the uk so i'm off work on monday and i also took thursday and friday off so i'm in the middle of a five day weekend at the moment which is lovely um on thursday i spent the day reading and sleeping which i'm sure we can agree is a good use of a day off work and then yesterday i went to town i went to a book fair with my dad bought a couple of books I went to Waterstones, bought a few books, um, I will film another book haul probably in a few weeks. I've got a week off in June and I'm anticipating that sometime during that week off I'll probably visit a bookstore, potentially buy more books. Um, so I'll wait until after then to film the book haul. I feel like I've hauled a lot of books recently but in my defence a fair amount have been second hand and I have had a birthday so you know it's fine and i've got space on the bookshelf so it's fine um but anyway so i don't think i've done an update for the last two weeks i've read some stuff and i've read a couple of audiobooks as well we'll start with one of those audiobooks first um so i finished listening to sinister spring by agatha christie which is a short story collection um i quite liked it i think most of the stories if not all i've read before in other collections so i think what they've done is they've just taken all of agatha christie's short stories so there was poirot there was Mar miss marple there was tommy and tuppence and shuffled them around and repackaged them in these four seasonal books and to be fair the physical books do look very lovely um i think the seasonal link between the stories is tenuous at best i'm trying to think what made the stories that i listened to spring like and i'm not sure there was much maybe they like mentioned a garden or something in some of the stories um but anyway it was still um a good audio book most of the stories were about half an hour long which i think is a nice length of a short story to listen to on audio book i can listen to like a half hour in one go um a couple of them i did dnf because i thought they were boring um i do think agatha christie you know some authors 
are very very good at writing short stories i feel like agatha christie's short stories are just okay she's definitely an author whose novels like far surpass her short story writing um but that was like a fine little audio book i've been reading that on and off for about the last two or three months so i've finished that one um then we'll go through these in order so i finished the mermaid of mrs hancock by imogen hermes gower this is one of the books that i tried a chapter off in that massive try chapter video and i decided to keep this one and this did start off really strong but then the further i got into the book my interest sort of waned and waned and waned um i am not entirely sure i understand what this book is trying to be um so it is historical fiction and we have sort of two main narrative strands um, and we do see how they come together sort of fairly early on in the book. So in one of them we have this man who owns, I don't know, a shipping company or ships. And the captain of one of these ships one day, one day comes to see him and tells him he sold his ship for a mermaid. Um, and this mermaid is not how we would picture a mermaid normally to be. It's, it's dead, it's very, very small and withered, this sort of creature. And... Um, yeah, so this, this mermaid becomes a bit of a phenomenon um, once people hear that he's got this mermaid. And then the other strand follows um, these women, one woman in particular, who works in a brothel. Um, and we see how the two sort of strands come together. There was stuff in the book that I thought was interesting. There was glimmers of really interesting ideas Um I don't want to give any spoilers, but there was some really interesting stuff that was sort of hinted at, but not explored in a lot of depth for me. And I think I would have liked a bit more of that. I feel like the title of the book and the cover of the book don't quite match what the book is. Um, there is actually very little mermaid in the book. Um, so that if you're expecting mermaid, you, you might be a bit disappointed. Um, it was shortlisted for the Women's Prize, I think, in 2018. So clearly it has had some acclaim. Um, but by the end of it, I just kind of felt, so what? Um, it didn't really, didn't really work for me. So this can now be unhauled. Um, then I read a book that I did very much enjoy, which was Exit West by Machine Hammond. I read this for the Read Good prompt for May, which is Magical Realism, read a book featuring magical realism. I've been meaning to read this for a while. This is the third book I've read by Machine Hammond, and I really, really like him as an author. I want to read everything he's written. Um, so in this one, we're following a young uh, couple, a uh, young man and a young woman, who are living in this country, which I don't think is ever named um and the country is sort of on the brink of civil war there's a lot of civil unrest and their relationship has to remain secret so they can't they have to sort of see each other sort of in secret in disguise that they are in a relationship and then the magical realism element comes in because these doors start appearing across the world and a door might take you to a country like halfway around the world and once people become aware of the doors and where the different doors will take them to, the doors become another route of migration. And then, of course, the doors become policed um, and all of that. So the magical realism element is sort of, how can I say, it's, it's not greatly explained. Like, we don't know why these doors appear or how it works, sort of, scientifically or anything. It's just they just appear and that's just how it is. Um, I really like Machine Hammond's writing. I think he, his style is a little bit pared back. It's not overly descriptive, um, which I think is why it works for me. And I think the relationship between the two main characters was done really, really well. Um, and it was very impactful um, at the end as well. I really, really enjoyed that one. Then I'll talk about another audio book that I listened to. I'm going to have to bring it up because it made such little impact on me that I can't remember what it was called. Um, I only listened to it because it was available on Libby and it was a two hour audio book. I listened to it last Sunday, I think, while I was doing some ironing and other chores. Um, let's get story graph up. Uh, here we are. It was called You Should Have Left by Daniel Keelman. Um, 
so yeah the audio book was about two hours um it's about this man who's an author who goes with his family on vacation to some remote location i think it might be in the alps and while he's there he's trying to write this book so it kind of has slight shining vibes um and then like weird stuff starts happening in the place where they're staying and we get a excerpts as well of the story that he is writing like within the book um i just didn't really get it it didn't really work for me I've, there are some like really positive reviews for it on storygraph and some of those reviews compare it to house of leaves which i feel like if you go into it what expected another house of leaves you you'd potentially be quite disappointed although saying that i didn't really like house of leaves so i don't know um it didn't really do anything for me apparently it was made into a film a few years ago i don't know um it just it was a thing i listened to it yeah it wasn't very good then i picked up a book which i thoroughly enjoyed which is the black spectacles by john dixon carr you know i love john dixon carr he's one of my favorite sort of golden age crime writers this one was first published in 1939 and it was just thoroughly entertaining from start to finish one of my favorite books and um, that i've read by this author um so at the start of the book we find out that there's been a poisoning in this town or village whereby some chocolates in a sweet shop have been poisoned and it has caused several people to be unwell and like, one person has died as a result of it and then um in this sort of the more present day we have um, a gathering at this house so one of the uh, a man who who lives in the village thinks he has worked out so uh, a way by which the murderer may have um, undertaken this poisoning of the chocolates like in terms of practically how the, how he thinks it was done um, and he sets up this stage in and he invites uh, people he knows to come and watch him um, do this sort of performance and at the end of it he's going to ask them 10 questions about what they've seen and the idea of what he's doing is that he aims to prove how witnesses will view the same event in different ways depending on what they are expecting to see or depending on their assumptions and the, those sorts of things and so the black spectacles in the title is um sort of like the what's the word imaginary spectacles that the witnesses will wear um so the book is structured around so the first chapter is like first view through the spectacles then second view through the spectacles third view through the spectacles and then the final section is the spectacles removed where we find out um what happened so anyway so he sets up this whole thing and he's going to put on this sort of like sort of like the performance um and then he's going to ask the witnesses these questions and by this he's going to prove this point about um how witness testimony obviously is not can it isn't always reliable and he will somehow um show that he's figured out a way that this poisoner has undertaken this crime um and there is another death of course there's another death um, I loved the theatrical nature of the story. I liked the, um, there are some sort of impossible puzzle type elements to it um, as well, which John Dixon Carr is really, really good at. It reminded me, and I don't know how much of a niche comparison this is, but I felt like this could have been an episode of Jonathan Creek, um, which was a TV show that I used to love. It was on in the 90s. Um, following sort of a bit of an amateur detective type character but it features a lot of locked room mysteries and impossible puzzles um and yeah it, it just felt like this could have been an episode of jonathan creek i just found it thoroughly entertaining and really really enjoyable um i will say my dad apparently gave this two stars i mean which i think is very harsh i told you he was a harsh rater didn't i i was like what but I thought this was absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'm actually in the middle of a lot of books at the moment. So I will be doing another update in a moment um, next week. Um, but it's, it'll be in like two minutes for you. Um, I've got a book I'm reading on NetGalley. I'm doing a reread. I've started two more short story collections. I think I'm in the middle of like five short story collections at the moment. So, um, but I don't have any plans for the rest of this weekend. I'm home alone for a couple of days. I've been out this morning to get supplies. So... 
hopefully I won't have to leave the house um, unless I really feel the urge to, which is unlikely, let's be honest. Um, so yeah, hoping to get lots more reading done this weekend and then I will let you know what else I've read. So I'll speak to you again in a sec. Okay, it's now the end of May and I have done quite a lot of good reading over the last week. Well, mainly last weekend because I had a couple of days where I really just read and slept. Um, I have done some good reading. Um, so, first book I read was actually a reread. This is Alex by Pierre Lemaitre, which is translated from French by... Frank Wynn. Um, so this is a crime thriller on the disturbing end of the scale of disturbingness. Um, so this is actually the second book in a series. I think there's three, maybe four books in the series. This was the first one to be translated into English. I think they've all been translated into English now. Um, but it was the first one to be translated into English and it was the first one that I read. So you can read this as a standalone. There is some mention of the previous book. So you know, the purists amongst us might want to sort of start with the first one, but it can be read as a standalone. So the reason I wanted to reread re this is because I remembered it being a really sort of twisty, turny thriller. Um, and it definitely was that. So the book opens up, um, we're following a young woman called, I mean, Alex, why did I need to look at the back to work out what her name was? Um, <laughs> and she's kidnapped. And she is being kept in a some sort of like big warehouse somewhere um, by this man. And then we're also following the police officer, detective, who is uh, trying to find her. There was a witness to the kidnapping and um, as well as trying to find her, they're also trying to identify who she is because no one has reported the, a missing person. So there are lots of twists and turns throughout the book. It is very pacey. It is pretty disturbing. It's probably on the top end of what I can read in terms of disturbingness. I did really enjoy the reread. I'm not sure that I would reread it again in future. So I might potentially unhaul this one, but um, it is a book that in many reasons kind of demands a reread. So that was why I did want it reread it um, but I enjoyed it and um, then the next two books I actually only bought in April um, so it's quite nice to be getting to books like quite soon after buying them um, so the first one was Joy by Samantha Lee um, and this was a really enjoyable queer novel um, so the book is set between Liverpool and Brighton and we follow Joy and Erica um, so they dated for a while um, when they were like sort of like late teenagers um, living in Liverpool. Then Joy goes to university in Brighton and they break up. Um, and the book is told in sort of two timelines. So that's the previous timeline. In the present day timeline, we have Joy living in London or somewhere near London with her husband, living quite a wealthy lifestyle. And Erica is living in uh, Liverpool with her current girlfriend. And through various circumstances, they're, they're still sort of in the same kind of friendship group, um, but through various circumstances, they end up... Um, you know, meeting up again and we see what happens. Um, I found it just really very enjoyable. I think this is a debut novel. I think it's quite a small uh, press. It's published by Northodox Press. Um, but yeah, enjoyable. I'd read more from the author. Um, and yeah, it was a good read. And then the next one I read was a short story collection. This is Dead Relatives by Lucy McKnight Hardy. And I really, really enjoyed this. So these stories are weird. They are creepy. They are sort of, they have that sort of like creeping dread feeling that I really like in horror. In many ways, it the stories reminded me of Shirley Jackson. They felt quite gothic in vibe, um, thoroughly enjoyable. Some like weird stuff, but not not like too weird, but just creepily weird. Um, one of the best stories I think was the title story, Dead Relatives, which is about a young girl who um, lives with her mother and um, 
yeah, these other women sort of come and come and stay with them, and the young girl's dead relatives sort of feature in the story as well. Um, just like very dark and deliciously creepy. So I think if you like Shirley Jackson, um, then this is one to look out for. Um, then. Then, 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 then. Where shall I go next? Let me just mention this one. I haven't finished this one, but this is another short, short story collection that I'm part way through, which sort of follows on quite nicely from Dead Relatives. I'm about maybe like a third of the way through. This is The Doll's Alphabet by Camilla Gradova. And again, a short story collection. And this is creepy and weird, but it's on the point of being possibly too weird and disturbing for me which is why I am sort of taking a bit of a pause from it at the moment before I head back to it. I am interested to keep reading the stories but they are weird so they are on the back it, it, the stories are compared to Angela Carter and Margaret Atwood and I think that's probably a fair comparison. Um, they are dark, weird and feminist. Um, I've read quite a lot of Margaret Atwood. I've only read one Angela Carter, which was The Bloody Chamber and other stories. And I didn't like that story collection because it was too disturbing for me. Um, and this is certainly going in that direction. <laughs> so I would say if you do like Angela Carter, in particular the, the, the Bloody Chamber collection, um, this might be one to pick up because it's definitely giving me similar vibes. So I haven't finished it yet. I am going to continue. Um, but I do need to break from it because it's it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, sticking on the short story theme then, I finished this collection which I've been reading for a few months. This is Detective Stories published by Kingfisher and chosen by Philip Pullman. Um, this was an okay collection. There's a variety of stories from various, um, quite a lot of well-known authors in here. Um, and some I like more than others. Um, one that was quite interesting was actually a non-fiction um, about a, what was it called? Fingerprints, Fingerprinting a Ghost it was called by Tony Fletcher, who is a crime scene like fingerprint specialist. And he talks about this case he was aware of where um, they were called in to well, to fingerprint a ghost, essentially, to sort of investigate this um, haunted house where a mother and her children were living. Um, and I thought that was, like, a really interesting story, and it was non-fiction as well. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily reread this collection, so I think I potentially may unhaul it. Um, we're kind of going out of order, but let me talk about a DNF, and then I'll tell you about the final book, um... That I did finish, which I really enjoyed. Um, so my DNF, and this is a DNF for now, I think, rather than a forever DNF, is The Idiot by Elif Batuman. So this is a book I've been wanting to read for a while. It's about a young woman at college, um, Harvard, um, and sort of like, I've only made it to page 40, um, so it's this sort of like young woman finding her way in the world. I think it's meant to be quite funny. Um, I think I'm just not in the mood for it right now. This is, as I say, it's been on my radar for a while and it's one that I thought I would like. And the last few times I've been to the library, it's been on like the display shelf at the front as part of the librarian recommends like set collection. Um, and the first couple of times I saw, saw it there, I resisted picking it up because I'm meant to be reading from my shelves rather than sort of from the library. So I resisted, but then like the third time I was there and it was still there, I was like, okay, it's fate, I need to pick this up. But I'm just, I'm just not in the mood for it. I'm not feeling compelled to keep picking it up. So it's going to be a DNF for now. Um, and the final book I want to talk about is an audio book that I listened to, um, which is I Who Have Never Known Men by, let me get the author, um, um, so by Jacqueline Hartman, uh, first published in 1995, so the author, the author was from Belgium and it was translated from French by Roz Schwartz. Um, so yes, I Who Have Never Known Men, it's um, quite a short book, it's about seven hours on audio and I thought it was a really, really interesting book it's one that I definitely want to reread and I quite like to revisit it in physical form I think because 
there's a lot going on in there and um, there's a lot of interesting stuff i think when i listen to an audiobook and i am quite a newbie when it comes to listening to audiobooks i'm only just getting into them um, but when i listen to audiobooks i think my reading isn't as deep as it is when i read a physical book um and i think part of that may be because if i'm reading a physical book i might reread a paragraph I might flip back a couple of pages but when I'm listening to an audiobook I don't I just like keep going forwards I think because I'm too scared I'll never find where I was up to again um but anyway I who've never known men is about um it's told from the perspective of a, a girl who is I think she's like a teenager um and there's her and there's 39 other women who are being held captive um by underground in some place um there are male soldiers who are keeping them in there the women have been there for years and years and years our narrator has been there her whole life um she's the only one of the group who 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 only knows this world who has never known the world before the women have memories of their lives before um you know their homes maybe their husbands their jobs but I think their memories of what led to them being held captive um, specifically are hazy. So none of them really know why they're there, what the purpose is, who who is really responsible for keeping them there and why they're doing that. So I, yeah, I thought it was a really, really interesting book. I really like the use of the younger narrator and... So she, because this world of being, you know, held underground in this place is the only world she knows. She hears stories from the other women of sort of their lives before. And there are many aspects that she can't really, she can't relate to. She can't really comprehend because she has never known anything else. Um, which gives her a, a, a unique viewpoint. In some ways it reminds me a little bit of Room by Emma Donoghue in that respect. Um, I won't say any more about the plot, but it is, yeah, it's a really interesting book. It's kind of hard to talk about without giving spoilers. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think it's a book that I will get more out of on a reread. I think there's a lot going on in there. There was maybe a couple of aspects that I wanted to stay with a bit longer and to see explored more. As I say, it's a pretty short book. Um, but I do think it's really, really good. Um, they, the edition I listened to had an introduction by Sophie McIntosh, who is an author who I really like. Um, unfortunately, I didn't listen to the introduction until after listening to the book, which was a good move because the introduction basically summarises the whole book. It gives you like the whole plot. Um, it is an interesting uh, introduction as a like critique of, of the book. But I don't know why publishers do that. I don't know why they put it at the start when it's going to spoil the whole book. Why would you not just put it as like some sort of afterword? I don't know why they do that. Um, and it's really annoying. Um, but anyway, I didn't get caught out with that this time. So that was fine. But that's just a word of warning. But that's a book that I would um, pretty widely recommend, actually. Um, and it's had a lot of um, love recently on booktube so yeah i'm adding my voice to that um so that's everything i think for may 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 um yeah let me know if you've read any of these books what you thought of them and let me know what the best book that you read in may was thank you so much for watching and i'll speak to you again very soon bye